this presentation has, born, has been born as a need for uh, me to explain some of the tools I was using to do uh, bugs investigation to my team. And they thought it could be um, useful to have a broader audience. And then, um, well, I'm, I'm going to be targeting them, but I think it's going to be useful for all of them, for all of you. Uh, I think the beginning might be useful for most like senior kernel developers just because it's tooling only. It's not talking about code itself. And the second part will be a real case. Uh, then it's something useful, you know, uh, for people that want to dig into a crash dump analysis or something like it that might like, uh, you know, things that I've done. Uh, so first I'll be talking about the environment I'm using at home. And I just told my wife not to, you know, uh, go to my office right now because I'm connected there. <laughs> and then I'm going to be talking about Eclipse, uh, how I use Eclipse to do kernel development. Yeah, I know, I know. And then uh, debugging a real case and how, what was done and how I achieved uh, results. Uh, so, you know, if you were interested in doing something similar, uh, you have at least a north. Uh, so, I'm new at Linaro, so I thought uh, presenting myself, I came from Canonical and before IBM where I was working with mainframes. For, so, for me, it's a big change uh, because I was dealing with uh, the new technologies coming out of S390, especially integrating S390 with KVM on x86 boxes and all, and then coming into a branded world has been a good challenge. So. Uh, uh, it's been really nice uh, working with this. Okay, so going to the environment. This idea was born at uh, when I was working in sustaining engineering just because when dealing with bugs in user land or kernel, I was responsible for backporting them to all supported versions. Uh, and this included a real uh, deep need on having all the environments ready right away, you know? So let's say I had, for example, a multipath bug, you know? I had to backport the fix, or let's say the upstream didn't have the fix, so I had to work upstream, provide the fix upstream, then take that patch, get, uh, I was working for Ubuntu, of course, so I, w I had to provide fixes to or for Xenio and then Trusty, let's say. And then I have to have all the environments ready, so, you know, upstream was accepting it. I would have to make sure Debian seed had the fix after Debian had the fix and then it was accepted there. I would have to make sure that it was merged into the Ubuntu packages. First for Xenio, it was accepted for Xenio. All the packages were generated and then uh, backported to Trusty and so on. So it required having a functional environment because I was dealing with, like, let's say in parallel, 15 bugs. So for each of those bugs, I would have to backport several fixes for several architectures, for several uh, distributions, and that required some kind of organization, and that's uh, how I came up with this work directory that I'm using right now, which is part of the first, uh, first half of the, present, uh, the presentation. So if you go to this URL, you don't have to go it now, but use it as a reference, I'll be, I'll be talking. You will find, uh, you, oops. So you will find basically this organization I just described, okay? Source trees for user land too, source trees like glibc, multipath, all the things that, you know, uh, might require a fix. libhuge, tlb, now that I'm, I'm working, LTP, all the tests, so all the source codes are there, uh, uh, being organized in a way that you can generate the packages for ARM, HF, ARM64, you know, uh, which I'm going to be showing. So uh, first, things that I learned uh, when I, so I wasn't working with cross-compiling itself because I was mostly used doing x86 work. And one of the things that I learned so far is that using containers for, with KMU user static was a pretty good thing to be done. Uh, because I, when I started at Leonardo, I didn't have any board at home and I, would had, I was working on an x86 environment. So I started doing all the Lexi containers uh, doing with ARM HF and ARM64. Uh, so you can see here, let me show you. So uh, this work directory, I'm basically sharing, shared mounting it with all the containers that I have, of course. And then let's say I have a source code that I want to fix and I want to test for ARM HF and ARM64. This shared directory is basically uh, shared among all my containers inside the same uh, machine, right? Um, 
uh, what else? So why not to use CH root, right? And the problem with CH root was the package interdependency. So sometimes I wanted to generate a Debian package for ARM HF, for example. So if we're cross compiling, things get more difficult because you have all the package in Debian, for example, you have all the package interdependencies, right? So having a name, a different namespace is needed, right? Uh, for you to deal with all the packages. And also, for example, uh, dealing with containers. Uh, with systemd. Systemd requires a different namespace for you to upgrade a user land capable of you know, uh, generating a new package and new dependencies in between those packages. I'm gonna be showing this uh, soon. Uh, this is like two reads for anyone that would like to start working with Debian packages. This is like mandatory. And then uh, uh, that's why I put the URLs there. And it explains all the needed, uh, you know, uh, packaging uh, files for you to generate the packages. And this work directory that I have, I have like a vanilla f sauce of packages. So, for example, um, y um, if you want to generate uh, the latest KMU packages, right, out of upstream, then you would download the latest KMU from Debian, get the Debian directory there, and then generate, use it, the Debian directory in this new source, this new tree from upstream, and generate like upstream packages. And it would fail because, you know, the rules for the Debian package has been changed, the source code changed a bit and all. So what I did was I created some vanilla Debian directories to generate those packages for me. Uh, and, yeah, so let me show, the Where's the table? Uh, let me show it, because it's cooler when we do it instead of talking, right? So here is the, basically the dev box and workstation that I'm using at home, right? And I'm gonna show the directory. And I'm going to show a simple thing as, you know, just generate a package uh, that is already there, being updated with background scripts and bringing me the source tree changes every, uh, every day and so on. So, for example, here I have the tree directory with user land source trees being updated all the time, right? And then uh, some of them, like LTP, uh, contains a directory, like Debian directory, right? This Debian directory is being maintained as part of this, all this tree, you know? And it, it doesn't have anything to do with the Debian packet for LTP itself, it's just something mine. So every, this tree is being updated, updated, and then this Debian this structure is generating the packages automatically for me, which uh, I'll show uh, soon. And then for me, it's as simple as just like this, this is LTP from now, you know, this tree is updated, and if I want to generate a package for a, any architecture, I would just generate a package. So basically, all my boards and all my, all my machines, all my servers, my build machine, all that has the same structure, all the source codes are being uh, shared among them, and I can generate the package for any structure. Let's say it's going to generate the LTP uh, binary package and provide me in a certain directory. And what I mean with that and why it is important to me, like I said, you know, I'm dealing with 15 different bugs, diff tons of different uh, packages and all. Uh, so this is important to me because, let me show, I'm generating uh, packages from k test and LTP and libhuge.tlb every day, every time the tree changes. And this is uh, something that I'm preparing. It, it's already in a repository, right? So let's say, for example, uh, LTP just changed, has had pushed a few commits. 
uh, the packages are being generated for x86, AMD64, ARM HF, ARM64, right? And then I have this repo. So let's say the LKFT provided me, oh, uh, we have a broken, uh, we have a regression, right? And the regression rep happened in, I don't know, a mem barrier. Uh, then I would say, uh, let's go for the mem barrier test and see what's what's, what happened, right? So I can test the LTP from today, from yesterday, and see. Was LTP broken, or was the test broken, or was something in the tree itself, right? So then I can do the follow investigations, and that's uh, how it's being done. If you go to this here, so you have uh, all the architectures, for example, ARM AMG64, and K-self-test. And then all the K-self-test being built, since some days ago, and the packages are being generated in .deb or uh, .txz, and then I have like a mini gateway converting the packages, so for example, LTP, I'm generating a Debian package, and it converts into RPM, and it converts to a targz if you want to just uncompress it, and it's doing this because we also test all the builds in Open Embedded, right? So Open Embedded can use RPM to install the package, for example, and I'm using Debian. And one of the things that uh, I realized is that it's pretty good having different environments for the, these problems, because whenever we see problems happening, for example, in our uh, boards it, with Open Embedded, sometimes I test in Debian and it doesn't happen right away, just because sometimes I'm using a different kernel configuration or sometimes I'm using different libc, this is pretty common. So for example, libhutlb, one of the bugs that I just had was exactly about that, you know, libc, uh, implemented a cache for shrinking heap, you know, and the new glibc uh, basically made the libhtlb to fail, and I realized that this was failing in my environment, but in an older environment it wasn't because the libc was older. So uh, generating the new libc here, oh, this is just a readme. So having the glibc generated here, uh, of course glibc had, has a hard-coded uh, preloader thing, but you can always force the preloader to use another glibc and test it. So uh, having uh, different versions of libc, you know, every day, uh, every month for me is important because of the test. So I can bisect it without having to generate the binary every time, you know, I can just like do a last month, was last month working? No. Oh, it was, was last week working? Oh, it was last week working, so it's faster for me, right? And since I'm, we are testing in now KFT different architectures, it's important to have for all of them. So let's move on. Okay, so I also created some scripts. So like I said, you know, uh, having virtual machines is pretty important and having uh, containers is pretty important. So uh, some of the scripts are basically cloning KVM guests for all architectures that I'm playing with, ARM and x86. And then I can basically clone Fastly, a virtual machine. It changes the host name and it sets all the environment inside the virtual machine already and has its work directory inside the, the virtual machine so I can play with the same source codes I was playing without outside it. And one of the fast things, so all those packages are being generated in containers uh, sharing the same structure. So we have basically Chrome, Chrome jobs running and compiling that, the, you know, the same source, the same tree. Uh, and it's two machines that I have at home and are compiling all the time. So if they realize the uh, git uh, describe changed, it will compile and generate a new package. It's the same thing here. But the, th the thing here is that KVM is used for reproducing bugs, not only for compiling the package. So whenever I get a bug, a problem, in LKFT results, I have to clone the environment to have that ready for me to you know, reproduce the issue and see what's going on. And here is where, is ent where enters the KVM, which uh, sometimes can work, sometimes don't, because I need a board, for example, if it's a problem with the board itself. And, uh, and also to generate new kernels. So this structure has also like uh, some scripts. Uh, Shua was saying about compiling KSELF tests, and I created like a script that does everything she was saying automatically and generates Debian packages for KSELF tests, and uh, you don't have to do much. I have to like 
make it better, and it's not rocket science. You can go to that work uh, directory source code that I told you. You will see the scripts. So basically, the build script has the mainline stable and stable RC. Those trees are being updated. So every time Greg pushes something into a stable RC, this tree is updated, and I can generate a package. Or I can, for example, tell the build script to generate the, the, the kernel Debian package for a specific version, and it generates for me. And then my scripts will get this Debian package and we install in the, the container that is being cloned, right? So, uh, for example, Anders has already been started using, where is Anders? Is it gone? So Anders has al already started using those scripts and changing and copying some of these things he liked it and put into, because everybody creates uh, their own scripts, right? So this is something that I have to, to prepare better, you know, but it's basically like, are, are you git clean the tree before generating? Are you doing a kernel config prepare and the kernel config prepare generating the, all the macro config files for you to, uh, because uh, since I'm using Eclipse, I need the config files to be, the macros to be all set, so Eclipse does the indexing using all the defines and everything. And then are you using the RunFS to generate the kernel binaries? And then if you are, what's the size of the RunFS? And then you just basically do a build mainline dash master, build mainline dash stable. And it will build the tree for you, generate the Debian packages and put in a specific directory. Then you get the Debian packages and install in the container image, right? So it's easy as this. So I just cloned the machine. It's based on key call image, right? Uh, I was using ZFS in the underlaying, but the problem with ZFS is that whenever you use copy and write files, like the key call files on, on ZFS, since it's a key call on top of key call, it's going to be a, a performance issue sometimes. So now I'm only dealing with key call images, and all the snapshots are just you know snapshots on key call images. So basically, I just cloned the machine, and now I can reproduce the, the problems that, you know. Uh, so what I would do, I would do, for example, I would uh, download the latest LTP, right? So what I, I would do something like this. So I just cloned a structure and I have a script this, as helper script that will go to that URL having all the packages and I will download the latest LTP. I don't know which one is, you know. It could be generated like 15 minutes ago or yesterday, but I'll get the latest LTP binary for this environment. And I can choose the packet format. Oops. browser. So it's downloading the latest uh, Debian package. I just installed the Debian package and I would run the test, right? So let's say, for example, one of the examples I'm going to be showing, the bug that I'll be talking about is on funnotify07 test. And then the LKFT just showed that, that this test is broken. I would get LTP install, and I have an environment to run it on a specific kernel, right? But I have to install the specific kernel. And imagine if I want to bisect. I have to script it, right? Because my, my job at Linaro, uh, 
I depend on LKFT, but I have to do all my own scripts, right? I would have to bisect something to find what was broken, and sometimes I cannot only use the lava, for example. I would have to do something by hand, but this has to be something scriptable, right? So what I've done here is that, let's say I want to install a new kernel into this virtual machine, and I made the key call image to be accessible through containers. So my virtual machine can be a container or a virtual machine. It's just like if I shut down, I can start it as a container. So now the same machine that I was running under KVM, I'm under under Lexi. It's the same machine, right? And then I can do whatever I want inside a container environment. Why, why is this important? Sometimes you generate a kernel dump, right? And you want to run crash on it. And uh, running inside KVM won't be good because of memory restrictions, right? And then inside the container, I would have the same memory as the host to, to work with. So it's much better. And then now I'm going to install it. So this is just a shell, right? But I've made some wrappers that I could install things inside the machine without having to boot it inside. It's called, if you ever see libgasfish, for example, libgasfish does something similar. I use it sometimes, and it does. So it's going to install the kernel now. So now, like, for example, let's see if it works. I'm going to install the Debian packages that were generated by that structure inside this virtual machine. And just, just one command, it will mount it as a container, install the container inside the virtual machine, and exit from uh, inside uh, the container and exit. So next time I will boot inside KVM, the kernel is already installed. It was just one comment. And that is important for me for bisection, for example. I can, generate, I can script something to generate the package, install the virtual machine, do the test, see if it works, get out, do it again, and get out, and so and so. So that's why I have all this structure. And the way it's created is like this is just for one bug. So imagine, like right now, my pipeline, my queue pipeline of bugs is like maybe 25 bugs I have right now. So imagine doing this for every single bug to, you know, to discover a, an issue that is going on. So that's why this structure was created. OK, let's move on. And then uh, this is the environment that I'm accessing, you know, all the boards and all my machines. And one of the things that I wanted to, sh to share is just that uh, Cork is your friend. So I, I, wasn't, I wasn't very, you know, uh, enthusiastic of having boards and where am I going to put because the cable is heavier than the board if you so if you want to organize it's really you know difficult for organizing several boards and also what I did was I prepared an environment with cork and it's, I put all the boards there so this is basically the environment I'm accessing and then uh, some of the, the the lessons learned from from what I just did it was having the Debian installed in SD card so I can you know, recover the SD cards uh, uh, whenever there are issues with it. And I'm using uh, usually the uh, MMC, internal MMCs just as a, a swap space for, for the environment, you know. And here's something Dan uh, asked me for. Uh, so basically, uh, using Eclipse for all this, you know, kernel uh, navigation and in the bugs. So, uh, here is that I've been using Ving for my entire life, but after dealing with so many bugs, so simultaneously, 
I had to, to have something that would provide me a faster navigation, and uh, I've tried everything that you can imagine. So I know all the you know plugins for Vims, all the managers for plugins, all the plugins and all. And I came up with Eclipse uh, helping me a lot uh, in fast navigation. So what happens is that whenever I, so since I'm not an engineer for developing new code, and I'm basically navigating on code that I've never saw, or if I saw, I saw because of another bug that I have played with. Uh, the things that Eclipse provide me, and I can show here, is, is something you know fast for me to fast learn and see where is the problem and provide to the engineer responsible for fixing, or sometimes make a quick fix. And um, so, uh, let me see if I remember what I wanted to show. So, fast navigation through the files, uh, just you know hotkeys, uh, and it has all index, all the files, so in kernel is pretty good, you know, like for example, you want uh, Intel underscore IDO, you know, Intel underscore IDO, it opens a file, and I'm in mean Intel IDO, for example, source code, or, you know, it's pretty fast for finding, so, um, what else? So, uh, searching for C code, definitions or declarations or all occurrences for functions, for example. It's just like C-scope, but it's a C-scope in a graphical way, in a faster way, and, uh, you know. Uh, it's easier for you if you, when you get, uh, you know, usage, a good usage of it. And then uh, it has a file search, and the file search is pretty fast because it's based on index. The only problem is that whenever you have an Eclipse instance, you have to create the index, and index takes like forever for you to create. So having the source code for the kernel, for example, inside SSD, for example, this, my build server has six SSDs in parallel, just so I can cache things fast, you know, because every time the tree is uh, updated, I have to cache all, uh, all the kernel tree so I can fastly navigate through it. And then uh, another thing that I like is having the outline of functions and uh, the call hierarchy. And this is the most important part for when you have bugs. Uh, I basically have to define, I have to find, every, every time, I have to find who is calling this function, you know, and uh, who is calling this, who is using this variable, is this a global variable or not, who is calling this function, things that uh, seems like, oh, you know, I could use Vim. Yes, you could if you are developing the code, if you are not, you know, I, I have never ever seen your code in my entire life. I have to realize if you are using that lock you know, or not, and who is using the lock and what is causing the deadlock, for example. So I have to find uh, easier uh, ways to navigate through it. Other things that help me a lot on bug solving is having uh, the Git history, you know, uh, in the source code. So for example, sometimes I found the issue directly into the code and I, I tell Eclipse to show the history and here is the change for example and then I can see exact commit that caused that change and if it's not uh, enough I can basically tell it to show me inside the git history only the file that I'm playing with and then it shows me exact branches where this change came from and if it's part of a patch set or not who created when and then uh, I even have, like, for example, here, when it opens several files, I can click in the file and I can tell, uh, compare the file for me with the latest version or compare the file with the subsequent uh, version of this change, you know? So I can see exact changes, you know, in between the source code. It looks trivial, but it's not. It's not. So having, like, a good IDE for... I wouldn't say for developing, you know. If I was just developing, I would use uh, Emacs, Veeam, whatever. But, you know, doing this several times in a day and having to learn uh, the source code in one day, uh, like this, for example, this is something I've done with Multipath. So this is... free in a version that was already changed by lots of patches because of different distro. So for you to see the, the size of the problem, right? And this is one day following the code and then suddenly the oops, 
there was you know, one use after free. So it's not something trivial. If, you would, uh, if I would do like a Ving type of navigation, trying, oh, where was it, you know, and then it's really complicated. So that was the, the main idea of showing this. So debugging. Uh, this is part where the kernel developers, like senior, might get bored, but it's sometimes you can you know see something that I'm doing maybe and and get some ideas. So um, different than developing, sometimes when you are debugging, you have to have the big picture, right? So one of the things that I have in my head all the time is how the stacks are being arranged, how they are being executed, what are what is happening on each CPU, you know, and then. Uh, the big picture of every subsystem in kernel. So, for example, every time I work with a different sustaining engineering team and I have to tell them how to get into a kernel debugging faster, I would say that instead of going deep into books, like for example, you know, uh, I don't know, Linux internals, go for the understanding Linux kernel, like, like Robert Love books, which is like a, you know, is a book of major topics that make you see the entire subsystem faster. Um, so what I did here in those slides is just the foundations for us to have. Ah, thank you. It's like a singer. <laughs> thank you. So this is just the, like the foundations of every uh, kernel subsystem for us to have a big picture when we are doing investigations. And I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, problem with uh, sleepable RCU locking mechanism come out coming out of the file system notify code, which is just one of the bugs that we deal with. It was just one, you know, and I wanted to show an example of how this, all, how this is put together. So first things first, uh, you know, you have to have in mind that all tasks that so running in the kernel have multiple states that could be inside the CPU or out. They could be waiting for, for example, uh, a specific situation coming out of, let's say you just wrote to a block device, block device went to a transport layer, transport layer is waiting for, you know, some packets to arrive through SCSI, you know, something like it, and then you are waiting for that. You have to have this picture in mind. So what, where is my task right now? My task is waiting for a condition. And then after the condition is attended, it's going to be scheduled into a CPU run queue. The CPU run queue would get this task and put inside the CPU. And when it does, it can be preemptable or not by our you know, handler or not. You know, it's different than just coding. It's just like you have to keep. And every time you deal with a new different bug, this big picture gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? <coughs> so for example, uh, the stacks, see the, how the stacks are arranged in kernel, you know, like one stack, one user, user land stack per task, and then whenever you join the kernel, a kernel stack for that particular task, and then whenever you have an interrupt, the handler interrupted the execution of the task that you were investigating, you have the interrupt, hand, interrupt task for that particular CPU, you know? And uh, one of, the things that I judge important is knowing the big picture for finding things in KDEM, for example. You know, so how would I see a specific flag for a specific task being, you know, uh, executed? And where is this task struct that tells me exactly everything about the task that is running? And how can I locate it, you know? So it's usually when you are opening a kernel dump and you're just opening the source code, you're looking for global variables because the global variables are <laughs> in spots that you can find them, right? And after finding the global variables, you're always looking for linked lists because then you can find pointers that will take you to somewhere it's important. Crash 2 does lots of things for you automatically, like for example, reading all the tasks for you, all the task structs and giving you pointers for this. But sometimes, like I'm going to show, if time allows, uh, you don't have this automated, and then you have to read the code and then navigate through all those pointers, right? So this was uh, an example. Uh, another example is how the memory works. And then uh, the memory basically having 
uh, a concept of how the virtual memory of a task that is being executed is a range, right? And having the concept where there's a text segment in the you know lower part, and you have the stack being arranged around the top, and it's go growing on frames depending on the execution of where you are, and then things like for uh, shared libraries, how are they loaded? You know, if you are calling, for example, a memory uh, malloc, and how malloc works, how malloc is getting the memory, you know, to grow with the heap of the proxies that you are into. And this is particularly important because when you're dealing with bugs, those, if you don't have those concepts, for example, let's say you're playing with huge TLB, right? You're, you're playing with huge pages, right? But you're, you're playing with the libhuge TLB uh, library. Libhuge TLB library by basically hijacks all the calls to malloc that would go to, to glibc, and it re-implements the more core function that is part of the glibc, and it's the function that calls the kernel and gets more memory for your heap, let's say. If you don't understand this and you're using the libhtlb, you don't know where to look, you know? So that's uh, the big picture you have to have in mind as well. And that's why I put those slides, even if, you know, sometimes uh, you're not seeing it now, but that you have it as a reference, that what is the exact foundations for the bug solving. Another important part is the MM struct and the VMA concept, so every time, you know, you ask for a memory for the kernel, it gets you a continuous VMA area, you know, and it tries to expand that VMA area for you. And if it's not, uh, it's not possible because it's a different uh, security mechanism, like it's a different protection, uh, it's a different, uh, then it will get another VMA and it, these VMAs are linked. You know, it's important things that you have to have in mind for the KDOM analysis. Uh, another thing is on the file system, so see, I'm passing, so I went from the, the, te uh, the processes and then the virtual memory, how the stack worked and all, and now we're doing the file system part. So the file system, how to, f whenever you have uh, file descriptors open for that particular test that is running, and then we have like the entry cache mechanism, so whenever you try to open a file, the kernel will get the entries for you and it's going to cache the entry, you know the dentries for you, trying to solve all the path, and after that we'll find the inode responsible for the file, it'll get the file for you, and there is a struct for the file. This struct is gonna be given to the file descriptor, and the file descriptor will be part of the, the task. So you have to have this in mind, right? Uh, another thing, uh, we've seen like some presentations about IO, right? You have to have in mind also that there are four types of I.O. basic, right? Synchronous, asynchronous, buffered, and unbuffered. So are you using page cache in, you know, for this task? Or you're not using or using directly? Is it aligned with the memory or not? Uh, and so on. So in here, I'm just showing, you know, like how, how would be to look up a file name and then the entry cache would be created. And then there are other things that you have to have in mind. For Whenever the kernel is allocating memory, how the kernel is allocating memory? Is it using uh, just allocating a page or the kernel is allocating a slab object? What is a slab object? Okay. And then uh, after it it's done it for you, uh, you will have the file written to the page cache. Who, who is responsible for committing the page cache? You know, which kernel thread is responsible for commit? And why is this part of a big picture? Because when you have a bug, you don't know where the problem is. You simply don't know where the problem is. You have some tips on what is happening, but if you don't have the big picture, you won't discover where the problem is. Uh, network, I think you got the idea, the scheduler. <laughs> and then, uh, finally, some of the messages that we usually get out of the testing, right? So the stack traces or things like so let's get uh, one of the problems. And it's usually, so for example, this was one of the bugs that we got. Kernel basically telling us that there was a possible inverse lock, you know, and in next. And is this something that I have to report to the upstream? So is this something that I have to report right away? Is the, the person in charge, uh, you know, would the person, the engineer in charge, like to see this type of information? And then it's basically sometimes we cannot trust what kernel is telling. So this was a detector, the the, hard, the 
the deadlock detector of the kernel, giving an information that after it ran that test, it could have found uh, a double lock problem or a lock, a lock ordering problem, right? And then you're basically, it basically describes if you locked it in a different order in multiple CPUs, you caused a deadlock in between them, right? But then instead of have, imagine if I would have to generate a dump and investigate every time something like this happens, then it's like super impossible to provide a quick fat feedback to WebStream, right? So one of the things is you have to go and analyze the stack trace and see if it's feasible or not. When analyzing this stack trace, for example, it's simply to know that this head here, I would open Eclipse, see this head. This head's a per CPU variable. So like if it's a per CPU variable, this doesn't make any sense because every CPU will have a different variable. Even being the same variable name, the pointers are pointing to per CPU areas. So it's not two, CP two variables. So this condition could nev happen, never happen. So it's a false positive. Uh, the other one. So the other one was hangs, right? This is an everyday thing. So you're, you were talking about having the test that broke uh, the, all the run, right? And it broke because it caused, let's say, a deadlock or a soft lockup or something in the kernel. And then suddenly that kernel is broken for s other tests. This is what we would be seeing, right? Uh, the RCU detector for the for that particular scheduler on that particular CPU would accuse that the task is locked up. So the task has been uh, to be scheduled or, or being scheduled in the CPU in the exact same uh, place every time, right? And then we have to understand why is it scheduled or it's waiting for a completion. And what is this completion? This completion is coming from a file system function, a file system not five function. And then would be our job to understand what is going on and to provide upstream. Uh, hey, you know, uh, you just caused uh, a race condition here because of that. It, I don't know, so like I'm gonna show you in the next slide, I don't know file system not five. And I don't want to know because it's not, uh, it's not our core business, right? Our core business is to understand those type of situations and then to explain uh, to whoever use that interface, how they broke it, if they broke it. And sometimes, for example, in these two examples, I'm not gonna open just so, uh, to spare time, but those two examples, it's different stack traces for, for the same purpose. This was a reg map area for the high keyboard and one was a oops, and the other one was something else, just because the pointer was pointing to something that didn't have the registers mapped and uh, exploded, and the stack traces were different. So, and this is an example of putting all of it that I explained until now all together, right? So it's basically one bug brought to us by LKFT output saying, there is an issue with file system notify on kernel 4.9 and 4.4 in all architectures. And then our responsibility would be to understand what is this problem, is it fixable or not for that particular kernel versions, and should I warn upstream, should I tell Greg, hey Greg, this is broken, you know, uh, in 4.4. Uh, do you want someone to fix or let's fix together or what should we do? Or it's unfixable, like in this case. So putting everything together, I was basically uh, generating the kernel, like I said, you know, using those tools that I mentioned before. It's like I need this specific kernel version for this test because sometimes I have the bug open like in January and I don't, and this, the, the test was mar marked as skipped in January, right? But then the development continues. So I want to go back and generate that kernel for me. So that's what I'm doing here, generating the Debian kernel and doing uh, all the installations that I showed in the beginning, you know, in the virtual machine and generating and installing the kernel installing crash and then here it's the container right so inside the container i'm basically installing the crash tool and the debug symbols for the kernel 
So that uh, building, the script, the kernel building script, is generating also the dwarf symbols for the kernel that I'm going to be analyzing. So that I have the DBG sims for, uh, package for, for, for opening inside the crash. And then I open Um, where is it? Okay, so then I basically install LTP inside the KVM. I have a container ready with the crash and debug symbols for that kernel, but now it's time to generate the kernel, right? J to generate the KDOM, right? So basically I, I run. So here I'm making sure that KDOM is working, right? Inside KVM. And here is a trick. So every that's the problem with having boards, different boards and different bootloaders. And so if you are dealing with the server architecture, all the K dumps are beautiful and they work every time and all. So in different boards, we have different bootloaders and different options. And I had so many problems generating K dumps in different boards for different type of bugs, you know? So here, for example, I'm showing how a crash would be, uh, a K dump would be ready inside the uh, KVM. And then if you crash the system, it would KZEC a new kernel and generate the KDump for me, right? But this is not what happened in the beginning. So I had to, that's do the good on, uh, of, of working with KMU. KMU can generate an ELF image of the guest for you without you have to have the KDump, for example. So I could have the KDump like I'm doing here, you know, the, the virtual machine is, is, is reserving some part of the memory to have the KZEC and the second kernel will boot and generate the KDump for me. Or you could have just the virtual machine running and in the host you could generate the dump from the virsh command, for example, virsh save, save elf image for me. And then I would have the image to be analyzed. Here, for example, you can set all these options to panic depending on the errors that are happening. So since I'm reproducing something that came out of LKFT, I'm basically setting everything to one. It would panic the kernel, whatever happens. Like if it's a bug, it's not. If it's a no, no NMI or not. And then I'm getting the LTP and running the LTP, right? And then I'm causing the problem that I saw inside the LKFT. One, just one run. This is just, this is a one day, two day work. We do, like, I'm, I'm doing this, I don't know, it's like five, six times, seven times a week. So that's why this environment has to, you know, uh, to be like that. And then I reproduce this. It's basically caused some tasks to be blocked, right? And then I, I, in this first run, I wasn't generating any kernel dump for this failure. And then suddenly I just failed and these tasks are in, a, in, a, in, uh, in this state. So you cannot queue those. If you try to queue, kernel cannot. Those tasks are total. Those tasks are totally blocked. And if you go to the ma to the main process of these tasks, you're basically catching the stack to see what is going on, right? So when when you are debugging, there are multiple ways of debugging, right? One is the post morting analysis, which is this one. It's basically just catching stack traces and the kernel dump and analyzing it. The other way is tracing, right? So you usually trace something that doesn't have the effect. So whenever the problem happened, you'd see a side effect of it, but you, don't, you cannot see how it happened. So you have to trace, like F trace, system tap, uh, I don't know, like O profile, whatever, perf. Uh, and then uh, in this condition, it's different. So this is a deadlock, and then I can see a post-mortem and see the stack traces and see what is going on. And then I generated, uh, <laughs> I generated automatic, automatic kernel dump from, from this situation, and the kernel generated a kernel dump for me. When this happened, I have the dump, I open the dump, demask, and this is where things start to get cool, right? Because I have the stack trace from a task that has been blocked more than 120 seconds. What does that mean? The task is in the exact same stack so the kernel has identified that this stack is pretty much the same for the past two minutes, which in computer timing, it's like a huge time, amount of time, right? So why, am, why are we blocked here? So we are basically calling schedule, which means that it's not a hard lockup. I'm not spinning on a CPU. This task is waiting for something. It doesn't happen. It goes away, and it gets out of the schedule queue. 
uh, and then it gets in a schedule again in a CPU, checks for that condition, and so on and so on, right? And then the, well here is where the DMASC messages can play tricks on us, right? Why? Because this is the regular stack trace of a machine that has dumped. And it caused a no maskable interrupt, and this interrupt has been attended by all the CPUs, by the handler, and generated the stack traces for us. And this is, ex uh, this is for example, uh, if someone is investigating something and doesn't have in the concept that the kernel has crashed because of something else, you would see things like Rex2 APIs and API IPIs. So it's basically the kernel talking one CPU to another, sending callbacks for the CPUs to execute something. But this is all part of the K dump. It's all part of you know, uh, the crash itself, and it's not the effect that we are looking for in this particular bug. So to make things faster, uh, basically uh, for, sorry, for this test that I was, so for this particular task, for notify all the tasks that were blocked, I had three different stack traces, right? And then all those tasks here have the same stack trace and then I have two different, uh, two other different stack traces. And then some of, if you don't have the source code of the task that generated this error, you have to do reverse engineering and try to understand what is going on, right? So for example, do wait. It's likely the, the main process waiting for the childs to exit. That's, you know, common knowledge. And then here, wait for completion. For completion. I don't know what is going on, but I know that this is not good, right? Because it's waiting for something to finish that it hadn't. And then here, uh, also, handle event, and all those tests are blocked. So my first line of thoughts were, is this a problem uh, causing the wait for completion not to work, for example? And then I have to investigate, right? So to, ch to shit a bit, uh, to show, we usually, whenever we're seeking for kernel dumps, we, we don't have the, the user land source code. You know, it's not common for us to have. But in this case, we do. So let's cheat a bit just to understand what was going on. So basically, this test was causing the, was basically open files and causing access to those files, right? The way file system notify works, it, it subscribes those files to a notification system. And what happens is, whenever you cause an access to that file, it asks user land. So you basically go through the virtual file system to the kernel, and then it sees who is the one responsible for causing, uh, for telling me if it, the access is permitted or not. It's a user land. So it goes to user land back again, and something user land provides the access, yes or no. And then it goes back to the kernel, and it tells the first task you were allowed or not to access. Just because then you can have a daemon allowing or denying access to a file, and that's what this interface is all about for, you know, like uh, antivirus and stuff and things like that. So as me, as a sustaining engineer or type or an, a, a validation engineer, I don't have to know exactly how Fun Notify works, so I have to seek for the pointers that cause this particular error. And the pointers here, uh, not to get like super deep because without, uh, if you want to go deeper, you can see that all these slides are self-explaining. And uh, so, for example, there is the, who's, who watched the net? There is a pie here. If you click it, and it's linked to the under, to the, to other slides that are related to this particular information. So it's easy for you to navigate to those slides if you want to go deeper into the analysis here. But the main, er b main idea when you are debugging things like this is to understand what was going on. So I get the stack trace. I get, you know, uh, I was waiting for completion. I understand who was waiting for this completion for me. And then I see, oh, it was the file system notify. And then I had an SRCU, 
you know, which is a synchronization mechanism. And then I have to understand a little bit further about the synchronization mechanism and who was using this index, so this particular SRCU. And the interface that was using was this one, you know, those two functions and those two functions I had in my stack. So great, so I, ha I might have a race condition in between them. I don't know, you know, I have to investigate. Uh, unfortunately, things are not like super easy, right? So I have to go uh, really deep into some stuff. Let me see. So basically, the RCU mechanism is a synchronization mechanism, right? And it's, uh, it's a read, copy, update. So basically, whenever you change things, you don't block the readers. That's the main idea of the synchronization mechanism, being really simple. And then, and then I, have to, I had to find uh, other tasks, because it's not only the user, user land task that I'm investigating. Who else was using the, the same SRSU synchronization mechanism? And I saw there was also a kernel thread, file system notify marking. And this kernel thread was waiting for a completion. So there were two tasks waiting for a completion. And that is telling me something where to go and how to find things. Um, not to get too deep into this, because it's like it's, uh, if someone wants, I can do it like in private. But then uh, I had to understand how is the SRU, SRCU uh, internals worked, and then the basic idea was regular task, phone notify is stuck, right? And then I have a kernel thread, phone notify mark is also stuck. Both are waiting for completions and both are coming from the synchronization SR, SRCU, synchronization RCU. So this is the situation. And then understanding how RCU works, I knew exactly that if this happened before, it would have triggered a graceful period for the RCU. And if it happened before, it would have its own, triggered its own graceful period for the RCU. So this is just like the facts that I was observing, right? And then the idea on when you are debugging is to make hypotheses and to, save the hypo to, to solve the hypothesis, right? So the hypotheses here were uh, basically do I have a problem on SRCU internals? This is, th uh, that's the part where I don't like because this was the, uh, this is the harder path, but sometimes we as engineers prefer the hard just because it's cooler. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, so this was, I seeked for the wrong path here because I wanted to understand better for the SRU. I shouldn't have done that, but I did. And then uh, this is basically trying to find a problem inside the synchronization mechanism. What would be a problem? Like a memory barrier. Let's say, for example, all the synchronization primitive, uh, all the synchronization mechanisms are based on primitives, right? So, like in atomic uh, atomic instructions. And since we're dealing with ARM, sometimes the code was developed in x86, you know, and this primitive. In hasn't followed something that the engineer thought when developing the other architecture, like a lack of a memory barrier or something. That could have caused the SRCU not to be atomic in the part it should have, right? So this was the first line of investigation. The second line was, is the color for the synchronization just, you know, is, did it make a mistake only? Which is super easy, right? Uh, but I chose the first one just because of hi personal history. That's something that when we are debugging, uh, usually whenever you are doing diagnosis, you take in consideration things that you, you lived in the past and not necessarily what the problem was. And I lived in the past problems with uh, RCUs and VC virtual CPUs in, envi in virtual environments. So that's why I chose this path first and it wasn't the right path. That's what I wanted to show. I'm not sure I'm gonna f like follow super deep into the analysis. If someone uh, wants, uh, let me know, and then we can do it in parallel, right? Uh, this is all the analysis on how to find the completion, right? 
Uh, let me see. If so. so basically, uh, when you are debugging, even if you want, don't understand the code you were into, like I didn't for the FS not phi, I knew the primitives and I knew that the synchronization SU was being called by these two functions here. So here was one key, right? And then, is this synchronization for the same SRCU? Yes, it is for the file system not phi mark SRCU. So this is something that is telling me how to how to investigate this. The other thing was like Eclipse, right? So who is calling the synchronization SRCU? All the functions that are calling it. So uh, file system notify destroy, destroy group, file system notify mark destroy, which is the two tasks that I had in the stack trace of that particular task that was running, right? And then so this is group one and this is group two. This would give me a problem inside the kernel. So this would tell me, hey, I have a race condition in between these two calls because the synchronization mechanism didn't work like it should. And here would be the second part. It would be the, who, who, the code that used the synchronization did a mistake, right? So first part, second part. To make things easier for you guys to follow, and because the time has already passed a lot. Let me see. So basically, I found a work queue in the code. I realized who was using the, the, that work queue. I entered the SRCU code to see who was working the work queue and how. And then I went for the callbacks that were scheduled for all the CPUs to see if the callbacks were there. And I saw the pointers inside the KDAM for the callbacks, and I realized that they were about to be run after it was just one Jiffy. So my kernel dumps showed me that after one Jiffy that it happened, it would have called the callback responsible uh, for the synchronization SRCU, right? But it wouldn't have finished uh, that task that was blocked, right? So this is a huge study. Let's move on to the second part, which is the easier part. And the second part was basically uh, that that, remember when I said that the, f the file system notify code was asking, so you were in user land, you would ask kernel about the notification. The kernel would ask another task inside user land, say, hey, am I allowed to ask access this file or not? This user land would reply. That LTP test was making 95% of replies to happen, but 5% of replies not to happen. So those 5% caused the file, the, the, the task to be blocked waiting for that response. And when you shut down the system, there was another call that caused the race condition. That was it. So that required all those investigation. And then the summary of that was basically this. Uh, this is the summary description, and then I found a kernel thread discussion based on this, because I knew exactly where to find, because this, this, after you've done all the research and you find the discussion upstream, it looks like, oh man, how did I, didn't I Google it, you know? It was so easy, there was a thread discussion, but I didn't know what the problem was to Google for, right? I found the discussion. I made a backport, it's 35 patches, and then I provided a suggestion to Greg. Greg said, oh, this is too intrusive, let's not do it. I said, okay, move on. But that's how it works, right? So let's say, for example, Red Hat or Suzy or Canonical once, let's fix this interface for the kernel 4.9. The patch set is there, all the discussion is there, the explanations are there. And I learned that this particular interface is broken for 4.4 4 and 4.9. And then we skip the test for this particular test. And this is just one of 15,000 tests that we are doing. Okay? I'm not going to extend more. This is the list of the patches. And it's just one 
case study, okay? I hope you liked it and it wasn't too deep or anything. Thank you. Hi, do you have any questions? No questions? Do you have any questions? <laughs> Many? <laughs> so if you want to play with the scripts, let me know. I can guide you through the URLs and how to find the scripts and replace the environment. Okay? Cheers.